you, Chuck. Uh, it is certainly a pleasure to be here uh, at CNU. I was last with you at West Palm Beach, uh, and so I'm so delighted to be back. Uh, just, I'll talk a little bit about uh, race and culture in my presentation, uh, but just want to share with you a true story. Uh, I recently uh, went to uh, Sydney and tried to get there uh, a day early so I can prepare. It's a 24-hour flight. And uh, I missed calculate, and I arrived two hours before I had to present. And so I usually talk about my background. Uh, I am a child of mixed race. And I just said, hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mitchell Silver, and I'm mixed use. <laughs> and I'm looking at the audience, and I said, did, did you really say, I said, I say mixed use to go, you did. Okay, so I'm mixed race and mixed use. Uh, so, uh, but before I start, I just want to commend both Len, Doug, and the board. Uh, I had a chance to see your strategic plan, and the fact that both equity and inclusiveness is now part of your strategic direction, I applaud you. And through this presentation, I'm going to share with you that these aren't just words, what it really means to embrace equity and to be inclusive. And when we look at the changes in our country, and Jonathan alluded to this, and is so pleased to be on a panel with Jonathan again, we were at Columbia University presenting together. Uh, by the 19th century, uh, we were really a population of 5 million, urbanized population 6%. And as we approach the 22nd century, we're looking at a country that'll be over 5 million people with an urbanized population of 90%. Well, what does that mean? Over the next 50 years, this country will add 124 million people and 2.3 billion on this planet. We, in this room, have to figure out where we're going to house and plan and locate 50 to 60 million new housing units, including everything else that goes along with it. So what will the next generations of communities look like? And you're here because you're going to play a major role in what that future will look like. And it's no surprise as we look at where growth will occur over the next, uh, for at least till 2030, the South and the West will be the destinations of choice. And I'm sure a lot of you practice heavily in those areas because those are growth communities. Both the North, East, and Midwest will have some population increase, but nothing compared to the West and up to uh, the, really the South and to the West. So if you happen to work in one of these fast-growing locations, there's Raleigh, North Carolina, tied with Las Vegas between 2000 and 2010. And you can see from this list, many of you probably practice in these areas, happen to be out in the West and in the South. And it's one set of challenges to work in a growing community, but it's another set to work in a shrinking or non-growing community. Can somebody tell me, shout it out, what city shrunk the most over the past 60 years? Detroit. I hear Detroit. Youngstown. Oh, I love this. I get you every time. St. Louis. Youngstown's third, yes. To work in a city like this is different, particularly for us urbanists and planners. It's not the same as a good time in those growth communities where there's tons of money to do new development. It's a challenge. And the reason why I highlight Cleveland and Pittsburgh, I call those comeback cities. Because when you go to these cities, you have to understand, they took a punch in the gut. Families were destroyed in Pittsburgh. People lost 200,000 jobs over a 10-year period. And they lost their identity as stealers. So when you go in there, before you even start designing, you have to understand how the soul, the spirit of this community was affected, the abandonment, the disinvestment that they had to go through before you even put pen to paper. That's something we have to understand. And I suspect the same thing here with Detroit. I've been impressed. We have to understand what actually occurred here in this country, in this state. So when we look at the challenges of the 21st century, I have to tell you, some of the challenges and emerging issues are brand new. They never happened before. So many of you in this room are going to have to deal with some issues that you've never confronted. You cannot Google to find the solutions to this problem because they're brand new. As I go down the list, these are challenges. And the ones that I've added, I've had a longer list, but I've now placed equity, income and equality, affordable places, and gentrification on that list, even though gentrification has been on there for a while. These are the issues that are going to find the work that we do for at least the foreseeable future. And a big question is, it's not just about what's next, but more importantly, who's next. 
We now have a new reality in the U.S. There are more older Americans that by 2050, the age of people over the age of 65 will increase really to over, uh, to well over uh, 50 million Americans. We're seeing it just triple in terms of size. More diversity, more multiculturalism, more people with disabilities, more multi-gen households. But one of the real game changers behind, besides just having a non-majority of race country by 2044, but by 2030, the majority household in the U.S. will be one person. Not a family, one person. That's dramatically changing how we're designing our communities. And so if you look at household change, look at the dramatic drop from the year 1960 to the year 2025. 72% of our households will have no children. And so it's going to start to change the way we plan for our communities. And a lot of you are already aware of this by having more compact, more walkable places to live. But it is changing dramatically. So I'm going to share with you very quickly what is happening by way of race. I'll go from 1980 to 2040 to show you uh, what is happening in terms of the diversity of our country. The darker the color, the more concentration by county. So this is 1980, 1990, 2000. 2010, basically, we are today, 2020, 2030, and then 2040. Now, some people are terrified. California, Texas, they're already majority, uh, minority uh, states, and they're still doing well. The economy hasn't fallen. There's no riots or bedlam in the street. But a lot of Americans are freaked out about what this change means to their community and how we're going to plan for, for schools and recreation and housing. And in fact, this is one of the undertones of the election that we're going through right now in, the, in America, the uncertainty of what this chart means. And all of you will practice in communities that are going to see this change coming. So it's not just about design, it's about planning for people and what this change means in the United States. We're all familiar with the three E's, the environment, the economy, and equity, but I have to tell you, equity has always been the forgotten E of sustainability. And I would always challenge people, if you do not include equity in your sustainability efforts, don't even use the word. It's three E's not to. So that is why I applaud CNU for pursuing equity as part of your new strategic direction. So exactly where did this word come from and how is it involved over time? Believe it or not, from the very beginning of the playing profession in 1909 at this incredible conference, there was a battle between Benjamin Marsh, a social reformer, and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., the son of Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, Benjamin Marsh was a social reformer, wanted to make sure that people were in the organizing documents for the planning association, and Frederick Law Olmsted wanted cities to be more designed better, less chaotic, and provide orderly growth. There was a battle between the two. And the architects and designers won, and the, and the profession split, there was those that pursued social issues and others that focused on design and spatial issues. And there was really not a reconnection until the 21st century. It tried to rear its head again in the 1960s with the Civil Rights Movement and again in the 1990s uh, due to social equity and social justice. But it wasn't until the Great Recession when it now affected race and class, not just people of color, for the first time this issue of equity finally came to the scene and now people are taking it seriously because people lost homes, lost jobs. People of all races and colors could see what an economic recession uh, can do to their life. When I mean equity, it means fairness. And it's fairness, not just people of color, but on this list is about gender and gender equity and political affiliation and religious beliefs. Equity and diversity includes all of these. Are we being fair about how we plan and design for different populations? And I'm very pleased to say that there are a number of cities around the country. I was able to do that in Raleigh, North Carolina, Rick Bernhardt in Nashville. They had equity as part of their Nashville Next, D.C., and now in New York, one New York, pursuing a just and equitable city. So why do I say this? Planning is certainly about place, but it's also, more importantly, about people. So let me share with you some of the work that we're doing in New York so you can see what equity looks like. As I just stated, uh, New York last year passed one NYC, a plan for a strong and just city, has four key elements. The second is our just and equitable city. It's very important that as we grow, we want to be just and equitable to all residents throughout our city. 
And in terms of my role, I uh, came up with four strategic initiatives for the Parks Department. I'll just touch on two because of time. Equity, placemaking, and which has a little element of inclusiveness in it. So let's go into equity first. So within the first six months on the job, we came up with a framework for an equitable future. The mayor announced this uh, very early in the administration to send a message that we are serious about being fair to the residents of New York City. We looked at the context of the work in our agency, and essentially New York spent over $6 billion over two decades in building new parks and fixing old parks, acquired well over 1,100 acres, and we had this metric that we wanted every New Yorker to be within a 10-minute walk to a park, and we were roughly at 76%. But to me, it wasn't just about proximity, because I can walk to that park with my grandchild, and I will not step foot in that space. It was not habitable for someone to play or enjoy. So it wasn't just about proximity, it was also about quality and our focus on how do we give quality spaces to all of our New Yorkers. We also took an analysis, it was a data-driven approach to how we're gonna fund this project, and we wanted to find out how many parks in our city receive less than a quarter of a million dollars in over two decades. And when we did that analysis, it was 215. 10% of all of our parks were hiding in plain sight and neglected for two decades. How many children and families and parents had to experience an inferior space for over two decades? That's where we focused our attention first, and we came up with something called the Community Parks Initiative. And it was no surprise when we did our analysis, these were in all the neighborhoods in our city that had really been ignored and disinvested for decades. And we wanted to make sure we sent a strong message that we were gonna change those lives through parks and open space. So we launched a $285 million initiative to transform, transform 67 parks, and you'll see what some of them look like. We also didn't want to wait the three years to design, build the parks. We wanted to have targeted improvements to show the community we mean something right now. So we used new horticulture, we started painting, we started making quick interventions, and we did that on 85 playgrounds. So here's one of our Robert Moses parks. Isn't it wonderful? Take your kids out for an afternoon, play some ball, bring a nice little blanket, picnic basket. Is that a park or a parking lot? I was there with the council member trying to find just one blade of grass. That is considered a park that counted in the 10 minute walk score. This is what I'm talking about. Oh, here's a better one. This one at least has a bench and some trees. You can go there with a date, probably propose. This is the kind of space that people were experiencing in New York City that we called a park. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. So we came up with this new design approach to start to break up the asphalt and using spray showers and adult gyms to help people get healthy of all ages, children and young people, and using bright colors to really enliven these spaces to make them feel community pride, to show that we actually cared about these residents. We started using all sorts of horticulture and stormwater and permeable uh, surfaces to start to beautify it. Every time we have a community meeting, the number one thing they say is, I want green in my park because we know what it does to the soul. There are all studies that show what green does, both not only to physical health, but to mental health. Because our parks are our living rooms in New York City. These are the social spaces where people fall in love, and they play, and they create great memories. We recognize we have an aging population. We know seniors like to sit toward the periphery of the park, and so we're making sure that all of our parks have seating and are multi-generational so that all ages can enjoy our parks, not just targeting one demographic. We want to make sure we connect these incredible green spaces through our Green Streets program. We now have 2,200 in New York City, and we're looking for an opportunity to expand them. And even with our tree planting, we had a million tree campaign to plant one million trees. We thought we'd do it in 10 years. We did it in eight, and we focus on those neighborhoods that were disinvested. Most of those trees went into the community that deserved their fair share of trees and green space. And as a result, it will now transform close to 65 acres of parkland and truly give 220,000 New Yorkers that walk to a park that they were denied before. This has been transformative in New York. Now, let me shift gears. 
uh, to playing and placemaking and being a planner. I'm the first planner to ever oversee the Parks Department in the history. We don't count Robert Moses. We're not sure what he was, but he certainly wasn't a planner. And so coming on board, we introduced planning and placemaking, and everybody was like, what is that? And so uh, we were able to have a conversation about what it meant for planning and placemaking. And my perspective, we talked about experience of place, memory of place, and authenticity of place. Now, I don't have time to go through each one of these, but I will talk about experience shortly. But in terms of memory, I told my staff we have about 400 architects, landscape architects, and urban designers that I employ. And I want to let them know that parks are places of memories, where people had birthday parties, where they proposed, where they learned how to ride a bike or swim or play. We want to be able to create those new memories for some of the newer generations. And so it's very important that we understand the importance of memory of place. And when we are looking to plan, we look very carefully at the different generations. And I want to make sure that, well, just so you know, there are six generations living at any given time. And I know that everybody in this room is on this list. If you're not, you're dead. So I do know that you're on this list. But it's important that when we look at these six distinct generations, that their values, needs, and aspirations drive consumer preference and market demand for neighborhoods, for communities, for parks, and for public space. And so I don't just listen to who's in the room. We make sure at every meeting that we cover all those different generational groups, and if they're not present, we'll reach out to make sure their voices are heard. They all need to be heard. Because in New York City, well over 60% of our X, Y, and Z generation are under 50 is really the majority of our city. And we just want to make sure that those who are older and have concerns about what we're doing will not dominate the conversation. I don't plan for who's in the room. We plan for who lives in the community. So if we look at the different generations, the previous generations were consumers of goods. The younger generations are consumers of experiences. So I challenge my designers to not just be designers, but to be experience builders. Because that's why people visit places, go to places, go to parks, go to retail centers, because the experience they get as a result. And so that is something that we challenge ourselves, that what is the experience? And in fact, I kind of made a joke when I was in Raleigh, but people got so excited. I said, you know, we don't go down, we don't want to plan based on land uses. We want to plan based on experiences. Who visits downtown to see land uses? Come on, let's go check out those residential land uses. It's about experiences, and we want to make sure we plan that way. And so here's the high line, some young people sitting on a bench looking at cars go by. Why are they there? It's the experience. And it's one of the hottest destinations on the high line. And we want to make sure that we capture that place and that experience so that we can have people coming back more and more. Here's one from one of my heroes, Jeanette City Connell over here in the room. Can we just give her a round of applause? <clears throat> one of the things that I was excited about coming back to New York that I can come back and build on her incredible work. Here is a transportation commissioner that actually understood the experience of place and converted right-of-way asphalt into places that people can experience. And so this one's on 8th Avenue, right near the High Line, and now people are just there experience the great public space. And the reason why it's important about experience is that we get over 130 million visits to our parks, not visitors, visits, which is probably the most visited destination on the face of the planet. That is the importance of parks and open space, and they're there because of the experience. Our festivals, which this was Jap Japan Day we had uh, several weeks ago, and some of our festivals. You may live and sleep in your apartment or house, but you live in public spaces. And we want to make sure we design it in such a way that is fair and inclusive to everyone, because when God, the, the grandfather, uh, the founder of the landscape architecture movement, when he designed Central Park, it was people of all races, all colors, all incomes, can rub elbows and share that same democratic space. That, to me, is what fairness is all about. So. Let's talk a little bit about the public realm, and then there's another one of Jeanette's creations right near Madison Square Park. That is about the public realm is streets, sidewalks, bike lanes, parks, public space. In New York City, 14% of our parks, uh, New York City uh, is our park system. But then if you add streets and sidewalks, that's another 26%. 
40% of our city is within the public realm. 40%. Yet we don't plan it as a cohesive unit. Each department had their own jurisdiction. But I'm pleased to say with the new initiative we have unfolded based on Jeanette's work, we now have a public realm team that includes Department of Transportation and Parks, Environmental Protection, and for the first time, we're planning together. That is amazing. So you know the reason why this concept came about, the average citizen doesn't know when they're on Parks property or they're on Department of Transportation property, and guess what? They don't care. It's all the same. It needs to be seamless. So this initiative that we launched called Parks Without Borders, the goal of this is that we wanted to make sure that the park and the sidewalk and the public realm were connected. Someone once famous said the sidewalk adjacent to the park should be considered the outer park. And that person's name was Frederick Law Olmsted. He understood that the sidewalk isn't a separate transportation unit, it is actually part of the greater public realm. The same thing in our charter in New York City, I uncovered this when I first got on the job, that actually the sidewalk adjacent to the park is part of the park system. That's free real estate, we own it. And so throughout New York City, rather than acquiring new land, we're reclaiming, reprogram the land we already own, including the sidewalks and the streets. And that program is now underway. So here is a beautiful slide of Rufus King Park. Look at that little dog just trying to sniff just one blade of grass. But we have a fence there, and why is it there? They have to walk all the way around another five minutes just to get access to this beautiful park and public space. All that sidewalk could be low impact development, it could be a bioswale, all that is parkland that one assumes is just a sidewalk. Here's another example near my house. Not only do we have one fence, we have two to protect those trees. For what reason? I don't know. Oh, here's another one. Isn't this this beautiful ILA of trees you just like to hang out? I mean, it's depressing how we're blocking access to those incredible public spaces that people need to be healthy. Oh, here's one of my favorites. So we put the fence around the trees because we thought the trees were going to run away at night. <laughs> we watched them. They didn't run away. But we do have this little portal you have to actually duck to get into. We're taking this fence down, by the way. And the community wants to have a butterfly garden. They were so happy to realize that we did not need the fence. Here's another Frederick Law Olmsted design. This is a place where seniors and the disabled actually sit because the park has a high slope. This is the front porch to Fort Greene Park in Brooklyn, and now we're gonna recreate this entire edge so now people that have disabilities and seniors can enjoy the front porch to this beautiful public space. Now here's one of our pools. Summertime, kids come out, have lunch, have a good time, but that's not what this space looks like. It looks like this. Why are we doing this to our children? And then we get upset when they react and rebel. We have to treat all of our children with dignity, and so that fence, too, is coming down. So we came up with this initiative called Parks Without Borders. It's $50 million was set aside. The goal is to address the edges, entrances, and adjacent park spaces that are being underused. The program goal is to make parks more accessible to improve the neighborhoods by making them more open and inviting and having these vibrant public spaces where people can not just get physically healthy but mentally healthy as well. On terms of entrances, we're taking down the fence to make it more open and more connected with the community. On the edges, we're actually lowering fence heights so that it improves the natural surveillance and putting more benches and furniture on the sidewalk so people can now engage in the park not ending at the gate, but ending at the curb line, and now is changing the entire area in terms of based on open space. And then these small adjacent spaces, which are caged off, we're now opening them up near cultural centers and schools and bus stops so now people can enjoy and be more active and, and, and embrace their public space. So here's one example that is now in design. Uh, there was a 12-foot high fence, and once again, there's a little dog just looking for some grass to sniff. We're taking down the fence, bringing the park out to the sidewalk, putting, wrapping the trees with plant material, bringing the benches out, and now this one should be ready and open by uh, 2018. The community is so overwhelmed and happy about this. This, to me, is providing better access and equity to our residents. Here are some examples uh, from around the country. I'll just show uh, one of them. 
uh, city center. Uh, this is in Greensboro, North Carolina. As you can see, the entire public realm is merged. You don't know where Parks Department ends or Department of Transportation begins, and it doesn't matter. It's a seamless public space that you can enjoy. And then here's one example in New York City, Father Demo Square, where now you see the matching paved material. It looks like it's more of a seamless public realm, lower fence height, more open, more dignified, where the public can enjoy. And then here's another one working with the Department of Transportation, Montefiore Plaza, very dead, closed off space, closed off the street, demapped it, and now we created this wonderful plaza, again, more open and more dignified for the community. We also have an issue with rules, because that also can be a barrier. Believe it or not, we don't allow certain parents into a, adults in the park without a child. I actually want to get a concession where you can rent a child so you can go into the park. We're changing the rules, too. This is not fair to a lot of seniors that have to walk another 10 or 15 minutes to go just to a park to sit. So we're making sure that we address this issue as well. We want to remove all those barriers to our parks. So I want to close by saying that we had a Parks Without Borders conference on May 24th, just a couple of weeks ago, and it had two meanings. It was removing the barriers, but it was also opening the conversation to audiences that don't normally come to our conferences. It wasn't landscape architects and designers talking to landscape architects and designers. We invited placemakers, tactical urbanists. We had disruptors. We had health professionals. And in fact, we gave 70% of all of the speaking slots to those who weren't designers. Imagine having a CNU Congress and 30%, only 30% of the speaking slots went to you. Because Parks Without Borders was opening up the conversation for others. This is about the next generation of public space. We have to broaden our arms and have conversations with all those that use our public space. And people said it was one of the best conferences they attended because the best way of communicating is listening. And we heard them, and it was a phenomenal conference. So as I close, this is one beautiful city. It is one of the most beautiful cities I've seen in a long, long time. And I happened to go to Lafayette Gardens, which is right near my hotel, and I was just enjoying this public space. And seeing the anatomy of this city and the story it was telling me, but there was another story. It was the caretaker of the space. Her name is Sherelle Stamp Lawrence. And she told me something all the historic tours could not tell me. She grew up in Detroit. She moved to Cincinnati. She came back because she loved this community so much. She was a volunteer and an ambassador, and she let me know the real heart and spirit and soul of this community that I would never get from looking at a design manual or going on an architectural tour. There's something about the anatomy of a place, but there's something about the soul of a place. And I'm walking around, everybody's telling me good morning and hello. I'm like, what is up with Detroit? Did you notice that? Everybody's like, hello, good morning. You know, why are you all so happy? They love this place. And that's why I believe Detroit's going to succeed. There's a certain spirit and optimism that is contagious. I love this city. And as people like Sherelle is why I'm hopeful and optimistic about the future of the city. But the thing that spoke to me the most is she actually walked me to the campus marsh. She wouldn't let me walk alone. She was talking to me the whole way, and she wanted me to see this development. But while it was beautiful, what struck me the most was this. A basketball court in the heart of the CBD in one of your best parks. What message does that send? Most places I know, they're taking out basketball courts. Detroit put one in the center of downtown. Those children, and it was filled. It was telling those young people, you matter. We care about you. That was the most positive message I'm leaving from Detroit, that it wasn't just about design. The decision makers of this city said, you matter, you count, you're part of the growing prosperity of this city, and we're going to do it to show you that we want you to be in the center of our downtown to enjoy yourself. Congratulations, Detroit. That was an impressive move. I applaud you if you're listening or watching this. So as I close, I want to remind you that planning is about people, but more importantly, is about place. Our demographics are changing. Our neighborhoods are changing. We're looking to you to help guide our way to plan and design a new future. I want to make sure you understand your community needs you, your country needs you, but more importantly, our planet needs you. Thank you very much.